Welcome everyone. My name is Joan, Dr. Joan Morgan. I am the program director for the Center for Black Visual Culture. On behalf of myself and our director, Dr. Deborah Willis, who unfortunately is under the weather and couldn't be here tonight, uh, we'd like to welcome you to CBVC. On behalf of everyone at the center, at, uh, at CBVC, which is housed in the Institute of African American Affairs here at NYU, we want to thank you for being here tonight as we welcome these two very special artists, Joshua Rashad McFadden and my dear friend, old friend, Lyle Ashton Harris, in conversation in, around McFadden's book, I Believe I'll Run On, an early career survey of his work. You're beginning to see examples here on the screen. This book talk and conversation is part of an initiative that's really important to us. It is a three-year initiative called the Black Rest Project. We are asking, how do black people take care in a climate of anti-blackness? What does rest look like for black people when enduring the long durée of black suffering? What are the subtle, sustainable, and powerful ways to run on without burning out emotionally, mentally, physically? Excuse me. And spiritually. These are just some of the questions that we will consider this evening. Our colleagues from the NYU Bookstore, we'd like to thank you. They're here in the back and selling this beautiful book. Please stay on after the event, pick up a copy, and join us for a book signing by the author. I'd also like to give thanks, not just to our audience, but to everyone who helped made this event possible. To Clarissa Santiago, our program manager, Sid Fulton, who was our administrative aide, our graduate student, student workers, uh, Emeka Ochiaga, who is not here but live tweeting this event, and Kira Joy Williams. The NYU Bookstore Director, Francisco Serrano, our photographer, Terrence, Terrence Jennings, and NYU Media Service, Services. A huge thank to our co-sponsors, the Department of Photography and Imaging here at NYU, to School of the Arts, NYU's 370J Project, Sorry, y'all, I am not used to having nails and turning pages is obviously very hard for me. <laughs> the Center for Media Culture and History at NYU, NYU's Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity and Strategic Innovation, and the Center for of Gender and Sexuality at NYU. So I'd like to just say quickly what's coming up at CBVC. First, please follow CBVC on Twitter and Instagram at NYU CBVC, that's the hashtag for both, I mean the handle for both, and come to our next event, the, which is the last of the semester, which, like this event, if you can't make it here in person, will also be live streamed. You can find out more information on our website, which is NYU IAAA at, o -R at dot org. So it's NYU IAAA -A -A dot org. We call it IAAA, but you need to know the actual letters, sorry about that. Next month, um, Thursday, December 8th, our public lect we'll have a public lecture on the history of Black Miami by Nadej Green, CBVC's distinguished writer, community activist, and residence for the fall 2022 semester. I'm gonna just do a very brief summary of this book because I wanna get to the program and our bios. By observing the interiority and quietude of black people, despite the arduous marathon towards justice and the various trials and tribulations that simultaneously impede and inspire it, visual artist and assistant professor of photography at Rochester Institute of Technology, Joshua McFadden's photographs explore and celebrate the intimacies of black life in the United States. McFadden's recently released book, I Believe I'll Run On, not only demonstrates his mastery of a wide range of photographic genres, social doc documentary, reportage, portraiture, book arts, and fine arts, and his use of the medium to confront racism and anti-black violence. It is also a testament to the healing and protective possibilities of turning inward. He critically examines race, masculinity, 
sexuality, and gender in the United States to reveal the destructive impact of these constructs of, on black Americans, like black photographers before him, such as Gordon Parks, Roy de Carava, Carrie Mae Weems, Dawood Bey, and Latoya Ruby Frazier, McFadden documents the beauty of black life and illuminates the specificity of black living in our historical present, including a series of impactful photographs devoted to the Black Lives Matter protest in 2020. McFadden is originally from Rochester, New York. He holds a BA in Fine Art from Elizabeth City State University and a Master of Fine Arts from Savannah College of Art and Design. His work primarily explores African-American male identity, masculinity, notions of the father figure, and the photographic archive. He has won numerous awards and recognitions from Lens Culture, IPA, and Communication Arts while he has been published in the New York Times, National Geographic, Time Magazine, Travel and Leisure, Smithsonian Magazine, Vanity Fair, and Financial Times. McFadden's newest ex exhibition, Joshua Rashad McFadden, I Believe I'll Run On is an early career survey of his work that focuses on the series Selfhood, Come to Selfhood, A Lynching's Long Shadow, After Selma, Evidence, Unrest in America, and finally, premiering at the George Easton Museum, the autobi autobiographical series Love Without Justice. Lyle Ashton Harris. Bronx-born artist and professor of art and art education at NYU Steinhardt. He has cultivated a diverse artistic practice ranging from photography and collage to video installation and performance art, examining the impact of ethnicity, gender, and desire on the contemporary social and cultural dynamic globally through intersections of personal and the political. Harris has been widely exhibit exhibited internationally and most recently in a solo exhibition at the Institute, Institute for Contemporary Art in Miami and in recent group exhibitions at Copenhagen Contemporary, the Art of Sport, the Los Angeles Com County Museum of Art, Black American Portraits, and currently through autumn 2020, 2022, at the Voor Linden Museum in Netherlands, Art is the Antidote, a solo exhibition of his work spanning three decades will be presented in the U.S. by the Rose Art Museum at Brandeis University and at the National M Museum at Duke University in 2023 through 2024. His work is represented in the collections at MoMA, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Tate Modern in London, among many others. Harris's most recent photography monograph was published in Aperture, and he is represented in New York by LGDR. Both of these artists' work comment on social constru societal constructs of sexuality and race while exploring their own identities as queer black men. In this conversation, they will unpack how one can find an internal rest in the face of these constructs. I would like to welcome to the stage Joshua McFadden and Lyle Ashton Harris. Thank you. Um, thank you, Joan, for that wonderful um, introduction. And um, as a way of, um, hi, <laughs> here we go again. You're right. Um, as a way of introducing um, or relating to the theme of Black Rest, I'm just going to do a, a short audio piece, and then we can go into introductions. And sure. We could begin. How does that sound? Sure. Yeah. Is this but we're super excited um, to have Josh here joining us at NYU. And so let's everyone give him a round of applause. <laughs> so I was just telling um, Professor um, Deb Willis, um, uh, who Joan mentioned, Dr. M uh, Morgan <laughs> mentioned that um, she was under the weather. So I was telling her, oh, I'll play it right now. Let me just go. We'll just start. We'll start here. Okay. There you go. I wish you a deep night. 
knowing that exhaustion is not a normal way of living. You are enough. You can rest. You must resist anything that doesn't center your divinity as a human being. You are worthy of care. Hello. I want this book to be a prayer, a field guide for the rest resistance, a document to be engaged with on the ground as we all navigate the reality of capitalism and white supremacy robbing us of our bodies, our leisure, and our dream space. A blessing whispered over your body and around your head, an embodied pilgrimage toward rest. Let this be a testimony to our collective survival and our present and future thriving. You don't belong on the grind. Get off the violent cycle. It is burning down because we torched it. Grind culture can't have you. Imagine a world without oppression. Take more time here. Visualize softness. Breathe deep. Envision a world centered in justice. Stay here. Welcome to your dream space. A download. A daydream. Stay here. Stay. So that's a good place to um, start. So, um, yeah, welcome again. So thank let's um, first um, thank um, Dr. Um, um, Deborah Willis, who is the director of the um, Center for Black Visual Culture, and to Dr. Um, Joan Morgan, the program director of the center, and to Clarissa Santiago, who is a program um, manager. So thank you for having us. Um, I also want to thank my students <laughs> who came out. I'm actually playing hooky um, for my class, so they are here with me today. But yeah, it's just such an um, honor to be here. I just want to just also thank you, Josh, for coming and actually um, um, talking with us. Thank you. And I thought it'd be good just to um, do a little timeline um, since we, um, Josh and I are good friends and Joan and I have known each other um, from Wesleyan. So we met our freshman year and um, all date ourselves. We <laughs> 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 I think it was 83, 84. So, and the way this came about, and I think it relates to the um, visionary um, work of Trisha Hershey, who we just heard, Rest as Resistance, in that this evolved, this presentation that we're going to unfold evolved really out of rest. I mean, in fact, it was our dear friend, dear friend Dream Hampton, um, legendary filmmaker, um, who was hosting a, um, a dinner this summer in the vineyard. And um, unbeknownst to me that Joan was in, we've been trying to get together for, for quite a while. <laughs> And so we had a lovely, um, we had a lovely um, dinner, and Josh happened to be, he came from my opening um, in um, Provincetown, and then we drove um, to the vineyard, so he joined us for dinner as well. So I guess when it, I'm sharing that all with you, not only anecdotally, but just to talk about how this came into formation. And so, but I think it's also important to talk about how we met, because we met in 2014, um, when I was receiving the David Driscoll Award, the 10th Annual, yeah. at the High Museum. And at the time, you were a master's student yes. at SCAD. Yes. And then you came to my conversation, um, my keynote that I was giving at SPE. Um, oh, well, you, sp you fast forward it. Please. <laughs> <laughs> you also gave a talk at the high. Oh, I gave a talk at That's, the high, exactly. Yeah. The next day, yeah, I gave so the key the next day. You were in the audience. Right. And then we, we right. became fast friends, and then you came to my, my talk at SPE. In Las Vegas. In Las Vegas. Yes. It started out 850 people, but after showing some work, <laughs> it, it cleared out. It cleared out to about a couple hundred. I figure, I, I love work that can clear, that can smoke out of space. <laughs> So you could actually get to the <laughs> get to the. So by the end of the talk, yeah, it was about ten people yeah. left. And then after that, um, then we we had our first conversation. Mm -hmm. February. I was looking today, February twenty first, um, two thousand uh, um, twenty one, deep in COVID, mm. which forms the basis of your book. Oh yes to the conversation. The conversation, the book. Yes. book. Mm -hmm. And then I visited you in Rochester for your lecture. Yeah. And then we did a Juneteenth party this summer for 40 people. 
Um, and here we are, November 16th, 2022. Right. A so year. <laughs> a year. <laughs> a year, year. So a year later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be, um, I want to just, number one, again, congratulate you on this extraordinary, extraordinary book. I should just say that um, on the eve of the um, murder, the... Um, execution of George, um, George Floyd, Josh and I were talking, he was, he had returned to living in Rochester after living um, in, Atlanta. in Atlanta for getting his master's and living there for a couple of years and teaching there. And then he returned to Rochester and we were talking and um, within 11 hours he had traveled um, from Rochester by car um, solo, I think a friend met you, if I'm not mistaken. Met me in Minneapolis. Yeah. Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And that forms the basis, let's say, for this book, which is, as Joan, as Dr. Morgan said, is a early career survey, but it was that impetus. And I'm really, I was very, fa I was fascinated by that, quite although that the images, several which we're looking, have appeared throughout the world and from publications for the New York Times, you know, Vanity Fair, the LA Times, it was your impulse to witness um, very much of your generation to be on the front line to go at the hearing of this um, lynching in Minneapolis that you went. So I think it would be helpful just to talk about, particularly for the students, you know, or all of us in, you know, here today, to talk about um, how the whole process of like why you inspired to what led you on that journey um, in terms of hmm. uh, yeah yeah um, we found ourselves on lockdown because of COVID and I, I guess backing up a bit before then I was in Martinique doing a lecture at the university there um, and I almost got stuck there because things started to shut down in the states well all over the world really. so this is march 2000 this is february february so okay late carnival okay. Was yes in february in martinique and so hmm by the end of it when it was time for me to go back really when i got back that next week school was canceled and then the following week it was complete completely shut down um, and so we were talking, we were all kind of grappling with what was going on, um, teaching online, trying to stay sane, I, I think, right? And then we hear, you know, a few months later we hear and see, not, not just hear, but see what happened to George Floyd. He was murdered by police officers in Minneapolis. Um, I believe it was right around a holiday. What was the holiday? Memorial Day. Memorial Day? And so I remember it happening, getting on the phone with you and getting on the phone with one of my best friends that I grew up with. Um, those are the first two conversations I had about that situation. Um, then the next day, I believe at my grandmother's house, my father was grilling, and I was just talking to my little brothers about what happened. And so background information there, I have all brothers, um, and so it was always this thing in the household of... Are you the oldest? I'm second oldest. Okay. So three brothers, two younger brothers, and the conversation always was young black men growing up in America and what that meant. Um, and so there we were again having that conversation um, with, you know, about George Floyd, um, what might happen. And this is before the protests got really bad, I guess, or some might say good, you know, in Minneapolis. Um, the next day I woke up, I meditated, you know, we practice our chanting and meditation. I meditated. Um, and I just got this feeling that I needed to go immediately. Um, and so I did. I packed a bag um, with not nearly en enough stuff because I didn't know how long I would be there. And I didn't know that I would end up there pretty much for a year and a half. Um, 
And I just drove. I drove overnight. I had this kind of different energy for some reason. Um, and I drove overnight. A friend of mine that lived in Texas at the time met me there once. You know, he called me and I was already on the road and he said, oh my God, are you going alone? Okay, I'll meet you there. Glad, glad he did because, you know, when it was chaotic when I arrived um, the very first night, you know, the fires were happening. Um, I ended up losing my car, didn't know where it was, and so he was able to help me look for it and things like that. Um, and so I'm very grateful that he, he came. So I guess that's like leading up to that moment. Mm -hmm. So what is it in your, I mean, I mean, because I, I myself did not go, so I'm just wondering what was it about, I mean, what, what did your parents say at that time? What did you, I mean, you were grilling, you said the day before, so did you check in with your parents? I mean, was there concern that you would be traveling alone across the country? I mean, what, what, what was that whole process? I'm just... Hmm. I actually did not check in with many people because I, I think that um, it's, it's easy to get talked out of something. And so I only told my grandmother and she, what did she say? I said, I have to go. I said, I'm going to Minneapolis. And she said, I know. And that's it. And I left. So my parents didn't know until I got there that I was there. A lot of people didn't know. I don't think you did either. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> you didn't, I, you know, the you next call, day, yeah, you know, yeah, you you're like, from, oh, you went, yeah. you're there. If on the road, so. So, um. Yeah, so what, what was it like in terms of what was it, I mean, in terms of at what point did you, in terms of you knew you obviously went with camera equipment, you went to d document, I mean, were you prepared in that sense? I mean, what was the experience of engaging with other photographers? I mean, how did you, how did you land? I'm just, I'm just interested in terms of, like, if you think about in the history of documentary photog photographers, Gordon Parks said, I mean, wh what is that whole act of somehow deciding to go witness in a particular experience, and what does it mean to um, the bravery that sort of took, given that there was a lot of unrest that was happening at that time? Uh, well, I think I'd have to talk about the fact that, you know, I've photographed protests before, so um, you'll also see you know, other examples in the book, in the work, you know, of... Um, Could you protest. name a few? We um, after Selma. After Selma is a project that I made in Selma, Alabama um, in 2015. And around that time, the protest... Is that the first year, right? What well, yeah. Ferguson was going on okay. at that time. Um, I did not go to Ferguson, but there was also the commemoration of the march from Selma to, Mont to Montgomery, 50 year commemoration. And so I was wrestling with the idea of, well, where are we now? You know, we see protests across the country um, for the same things that, you know, the civil rights leaders marched for back in 1965. Um, and so I was thinking about that. And so I traveled to Alabama to document those protests, um, but also protest in Atlanta, um, surrounding areas, I, I would photograph that. And so bringing that through from 2015 to 2020 was hmm, different for me. It was, it, it was, it was different um, in 2020 because I would say in 2017, we were, well, I was working on my first book, Come to Selfhood, and we did a conversation for that book. Um, and I think we were at your studio doing that conversation, but we heard um, of the police killing of Philando Castile. And that was in the city. I mean, yeah. it's curious to me because that, I mean, you, we're talking about the, the documentary impulse as yeah. well as um, protest work, but um, a lot of the work is highly personal, highly autobiographical, and I'm just interested in um, the relationship in terms of like if in terms of the construction of the self but also in terms of your um come to selfhood for example or the project where you have um young um 
African-American men from different gender identifications, et cetera, uh, with portraits of their father and the, you know, and, and, and the whole act of like writing um, letters, and which is very um, healing in terms of thinking about the relation between black men, um, particularly um, black men and their sons or black men and, 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 the, and their fathers. And I'm wondering to what extent is that deep um, personal, but also healing work, which is also about um, reconstructing other narratives around the idea of the family, the black family lineage, et cetera, how that actually um, influences, let's say, the protest work. Because I don't think this is just someone who is going out and chasing, you know, um, unrest around the country, but someone is coming to the work with a highly personal sense of the way of thinking about identity, about how we, he the healing of the self, the healing of the black community, the healing of relations between black men, from both a collective sense, but also a highly personal sense. For example, here, maybe for those who have not read the book, if you could talk, uh, what are we looking at right here? Jamel Moody, 2017, from Evidence. I mean, I think it'd be helpful for people to understand what's happening in, the, in, in this mm -hmm. image well, right here. Well, back in, well, that was a long question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, so if you, uh, if we back up a little bit, and if I can go back personally to, I guess, the conversations like I had with my brothers, you know, cooking out, which I, you know, which could seem like a celebration or rest, right? We are gathering. <laughs> Um, cooking out at my grandmother's house, yet we're talking about police brutality. And I think that's, that's just how we almost can't exist without having those tra traumatic experiences and conversations. And so with the work you see with the portraits and the handwriting, it's me trying to kind of get away from just um, the protest images of of actually being in the streets and to actually go and ask young people, well, what are you thinking? What do you think about what's going on? Mm. Uh, what are you bringing to the situation and what is it bringing to you? Um, you know, then also looking at ideas of family constructs, masculinity, and how does that was exist within uh, I guess the entire narrative. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think it'd be helpful to talk a little bit about like your journey because I mean you left, you were born in Rochester and you left um, to go to, what did you do your undergraduate work? You? Elizabeth City State. And, and where University. is that? That's, That's in North Carolina. North it's, Carolina. Uh, historically what was college. your your What was the reason for joining, joining from let's say the North, let's say South. I mean, how did that come into existence? What was the reason? Yeah. Well, my family has deep connections in the South, right? So a lot of my family um, still lives in the South. Okay. Um, my grandmother on my father's side is from Florida, Sanford. Um, and then my grandfather on my father's side is from South Carolina, um, small town near Columbia. Um, and then on my mother's side, they're from Alabama. Camden. And how do they find their way in Rochester? Uh, well, so if we started on my grandfather's side um, and grandmother's side, you know, they basically started to leave Florida and North Carolina one by one um, to work, to do other jobs other than working on a farm. Mm -hmm. And so they were looking to change their lives. Um, and that's the same um, for my mother's mm -hmm. side. Um, my grandmother and grandfather left um, right after they graduated. And so I believe they were 18 mm -hmm. um, when they moved to New York City. And so went from, you know, small town Camden, Alabama to Harlem. And so, um, you know, talk about black imagination, right? Um, I recently went back or went to visit Camden mm -hmm. to see um, what that was like. And my great aunt still lives there on my great grandmother's land. Um, and I was able to see where they grew up, 
how they grew up and I was able to speak to her. She actually just recently passed. And um, she's in, I made her photograph, she's in the book. But um, it allowed me to actually um, paint the picture of what it was like for my grandmother and grandfather to leave um, and almost like not look back. Um, and I can only imagine what they went through in the South at that time. And your grandfather worked at Kodak for? On my father's side, yeah. On your father's side. Yeah. And what was he, what years were he, was he at Kodak? Uh, 80s, 90s. I, okay. I, would, I would say 90s. Okay. Yeah. Um, until he retired. And what was your life like in Rochester? Because in a way, you're returning. I mean, now you're an assistant professor um, yeah. at the university there and just had this extraordinary show um, at the Eastman House. What, what was it like to return home to Rochester? and to reconnect with your family and also to somehow come back um, to have this major exhibition at, at the yeah. Eastman House um, as well as to be um, reconnecting with your family after. What, ha tell us about that journey for you. Well, that's interesting because it's almost like I was doing the opposite of my, what my grandparents did. I left Rochester and I said I would never go back. At 18, I left. Why is, why is that, if you don't mind us asking? Uh, I, I wanted to find my own way, you know, uh, as, as a young queer child who was misunderstood, right? Um, I wanted to leave. And so I did. I did. I left. And I went further and further south <laughs> until I found myself in Atlanta and I lived and worked there, did, you know, did grad school. Um, and so I found myself going back to Rochester. I got a residency at the Visual Studies Workshop. And when I, you know, I applied for it. But then when I got it, I said, oh, my goodness, I'm going to have to go back home. You know, what is that going to be like? Um, and it just kind of pushed me um, to confront things that needed to be confronted um, to further my work and do a deeper dive into self, um, which the result is, you know, Love Without Justice, um, my newest, newest project. Could you talk a little more about that what, that, what that means for you? I mean... What what means for me? Well, you say that, I mean, from my understanding, there's a return home in a way that proposed certain challenges to the idea of the family, um, as opposed to the narrative of, as you're saying, being black and queer, that one finds freedom or identity away. The fact that you, in actuality, came back and to reimagine the family, to reimagine the idea of home, and to challenge that, and to breathe elasticity into that. So I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about that from your process, because I admire you for doing that. You know, the fact that, of course, the traditional narrative is that we leave, but in actuality, you have not only gone back home, um, a prodigal son, and come back um, with institutional support by the university, a major exhibition there, and reimagining what that family is. So I'm just curious what that is like in your experience for the family and, what, I mean, and how the work, how the process of art is, helps to shape or to reimagine that for you. Well, inter it's, that's an interesting question because it's still shaping and reshaping <laughs> <laughs> as we speak. So I, it's hard to answer because it's yeah. happening now. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's only been three years, but, you know, a good two chunks, two years of that is, is COVID. Um, and so, you know, um, right when I returned, well, I knew I was being drawn back. I was being called back, I think, by a, a higher call, you know. And... It was around the time my grandmother was ill, my mother's mother. And um, I would talk to my grandmother all the time. Both my grandmothers, I, you know, I'd call them and we, we would chat. Um, and my grandmother on my mother's side always wanted to travel the world. As you, you, know, as you can see, she left Alabama, moved to New York City, big ambitions and dreams and things like that. And so she would tell me these things. Um, and she would see that I was in school, you know, I was able to do residencies and things overseas, Spain, you know, Italy, 
um, France, um, and we would talk about that, mm. and she would encourage me. Um, and then when she got sick, she had cancer, um, I would go back to Michigan and visit her. And so when 2018 arrived, which is when I got the residency in Rochester, I said, you know what? I have to take it upon myself to um, change the narrative. Um, and what does freedom look like for me? And as you can see in some of the work, you'll see that I asked some of the participants, what is freedom to you? And in a way, I was using that work to see what my peers were saying about freedom because I didn't know myself. And so really I was learning from my peers, but also um, in conversations like with you or whoever else, I would kind of come to the conclusion that, oh, I need to find um, what freedom means for myself. And so a part of that was going back home to reimagine, as you say, the home space and what that means. Um, and so when I did return in 2018, no, now 2019, to begin at RIT, my grandmother passed um, the very next month in October. Uh, and it just kind of blew my mind, you know, that I was kind of being drawn in that way. And you see, um, I guess, the burial photo, that's, that's from my grandmother's funeral. And so I'm documenting during this time. I was able to speak with her um, uh, as she was under my mother's care. So my mother was my grandmother's caretaker. And I went and spoke to her. And I spoke to her about photographs. And she told me stories about her as a young person in Harlem um, with my grandfather. And she talked about photography. And my grandfather was an apprentice in a uh, photo studio, all of those types of things. And it helped me kind of build um, these uh, other stories outside of, I guess, traumatic experiences um, that I had growing up. Thank you so much. So how does, I'm just curious, how does all of that um, personal work, um, I mean, just in terms of looking at the, the documentary impulse in the work, I'm thinking about the portrait of um, Breonna Taylor's mother and also, or the, um, after the verdict of, um, that was in Minneapolis, I'm just thinking about, ev or even Breonna Taylor's, her, her, four, her, her four girlfriends. This is, um, this is Josh's my mother. Here. mother. And that's in the backyard of my grandmother's house. And this was made in Minneapolis. And that's actually my friend who came to meet me there in Minneapolis. And so I actually returned to make that photograph. In Minneapolis. In Minneapolis, okay. yeah. And that was done, um, what year was that done? That was actually done in 2021. Yeah. Could you tell us about um, this one? Uh, this is E.W. Higginbottom and his father was lynched by a lynch mob. And so he actually never really had a chance to really know his father because he was an infant. Was this uh, Professor Brian Stevenson? Where was um, that? So the, that was a part of the soil collection oh. ceremony for the EJI, yes. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so here's evidence, and this is the work that I'm asking, um, you know, what do you think about this term, I am a man or be a man? But then also asking, what's your idea of freedom? And they have the, the, you know, they have the agency to write whatever they want. Um, and so then people are able to engage with these papers and with their writing, um, not only like this, but in a newspaper that I published and that I disseminate for, for free. And how do you find your subjects? I mean, how do you meet people? I mean, how do you do, are you, free? these are friends or people, fellow students or former students or how do you um, locate them? Just day by day interactions. Um, some were classmates. So some of this yeah. work was made while I was in grad school. So some are classmates, some are friends of friends, some are friends, um, some are random people that I meet. 
um, all different types of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and this is from the project After Selma that I spoke about um, commemorating the march from Montgomery, um, Selma to Montgomery, sorry. Could you tell us about um, 50 year anniversary for those who, who might not be familiar? Oh, yes. So, um, in, that was in 1965, the march led by Martin Luther King um, in Selma uh, to Montgomery, and, which was a march that helped um, African Americans achieve voters' rights um, in this country. Uh, but that march, you know, was not successful the first time because they were met by um, police officers and they were beat by police officers. And so that's why it was called Bloody Sunday. And now they have that commemoration every year. And so in 2015, that was the 50th um, commemoration. And we just saw Breonna Taylor's uh, mother. Yes, that was Breonna Taylor's mother. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, I mean, that year was rough, and I'm still kind of dealing with that trauma. So, so tell us, I mean, what is it, what do you say? I mean, just, I mean for, those of, for those of us who are not photographers and what would it mean to encounter someone who's in the process of grief? I mean, I think one of the things that came up in the, um, the, the REST project is the fact to allowing space to properly grieve. So what was it like to witness her and to be in conversation with her and the act of photographing um, a bereaved mother? I mean, well, I'm just I'm curious. I mean, obviously she'd been photographed, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times, but I was wondering in terms of how do you as a photographer, and meaning Joshua, how do you engage your subjects? I mean, what in terms of engaging a rapport? I'm just curious about that whole process. Um, it's, it's different every time, um, so I would say situational. I mean, it's always like with respect, and I think, number one, sometimes, or a lot of times, um, people don't approach people with respect, and that's even if you don't have a camera. <laughs> that's just in general, right? Can you and say so more about that? that? I mean, that's what I mean. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you I'll know, give, for respect. Give, yeah, you I know, mean, I think yeah. that I, th I think that's it should come natural. But, but I don't think it does. But I, mean, I don't think it yeah. does for many. And I'll give an example. When I shot my first cover story for the New York Times magazine, mm -hmm. um, that um, I was the prompt was the, the woman was she can see the two kids on crack. Um, you know, there were ro roaches. There was a whole narrative, a script about what I'm going to be looking for, for example. But the question is, that you're, as you're saying, just to echo what you're saying, is how you choose to frame the, the subject. So, in a way, it's not neutral. It's all about how, what the photographer or the writer brings to the subject. In fact, when that portrait appeared in the cover of the New York Times Magazine, it went straight to the top because it was an element of nobility that they were not used to. In fact, when I got the assignment initially, I mentioned, I mentioned the bell hooks. And I grew up you know, in a very critical family that we were critical of certain portraits of, let's say, stereotypical portraits of black folks, et cetera. So I was ambivalent about should I even go to Chicago to, be, to the former Cabrini Green to photograph, but it was really, as you're saying, is, is what you bring as a photographer or a writer to construct the other, if you will. So what I am deeply moved by your work, there is the element of nobility in terms of and sensitivity that for me, it, it, it's the work embodies that for me. Even the portrait of, let's say, well, your mother, of course, but also the, the portraits of Brianna's, her four girlfriends. I mean, just thinking about that image of the four um, young women who are by the, the waterfront and I mean, it's, it's so imbued, for me, it's so imbued with an element of, let's say, sadness, but also strength. And in a way, it's also talked, it makes you think about the, the, the vitality and the youth that had been snuffed out by seeing it evidence in the, 
I mean, from the, you know, from the handbag to the slippers, I mean, the, just, you know, black female youth and style and what it means to, it speaks of the absence of that. So, but I'm very interested in how you as an artist, as a photographer, and as someone who is visualizing life is able to bring a level of sensitivity and to imbue that in a commercial slash editorial sense when often it is not there, for example. Self-regard, Self yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's very, it's very important to me. And I think it's also important to say that, you know, um, you know, in, in, you know, when working for publications and with publications, you know, there's a, there's a wrestle for control. It's all, you know, it's control um, over uh, the image, the, the message, the text, um, and the final product. And, you know, it's, it's a back and forth. Um, and not every editor is, you know, the same. <laughs> yes, yeah. And so, you know, you're, 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 you're dealing with all of that stuff um, when telling stories for publications. Mm -hmm. Now, what I really love about that, I mean, as a congratulations on a powerful book, and I was sharing with an um, intern of mine today, and because I think there's an the element of amnesia, um, from my experience, even in New York, just thinking about when you were out on the road and just... I was upstate and just thinking about the level of protests and the social activism, BLM, you know, uh, all the energy, the fact that the city had reimagined itself as a place for youth, you know, thinking about where, um, and now something shifted, you know, radically. And I'm thinking about how the, the text, the book, functions as a document of something, a deeply pivotal time, you know, which has definitely influenced where we are today. So, um, yes, I think it's, it's deeply, I mean, this is a photograph of uh, Brianna's, uh, her girlfriends. Yeah, yeah, that was, that So was tell us about that experience. I mean, how did you ask them? Were they hanging out or by the water? I mean, what, how, how that came to be, how the, how the well, portrait yeah. came to be? Well, that, the, then this is Brianna Tedder's mother. Yes. Um, well, it was it was just so sad. It was it was just so sad, you know. I think that with Brianna Taylor's story and how um initially nobody even knew about what happened just made it that much worse. And so talking with her friends um uh, about how they were working to get that hashtag out there really spoke volumes, you know, about say her name, you know, and I, I and that just sits sits with me um, about how Breonna Taylor's story was going, you know, ignored um, and, you know, getting lost in the sauce, basically. And um, they talked about their childhood experiences, you know. They talked about going to school, you know, just regular days and just their disbelief. Um, yeah. So with regard to the theme for um, the center's um, three-year-long unrest and black rest, I mean, I'm just curious, to, I mean, how do you, I mean, the, the act of self-care, because this is a form of witnessing, and how does rest figure in to a healing modality in terms of taking care of oneself through the process of um, creating work, witnessing, being on the road, um, being tear gassed, you know, um, by the police, you know, being called, you know, I don't know, racial epithets or homophobic epithets. What do you deal with? You know, I mean, how do you, speaking of rest, I mean, it would be helpful for the audience or for me, <laughs> for that matter, to talk about the idea of rest. How, what does it mean to self care, to love oneself? Um, at the same time, continue to do it is what you do. 
at the same t- right at the same time i it, it you know sometimes you you say like well what what is the answer and what what is the answer that people want to hear <laughs> and what's we the want, true we answer? Want, i mean we're, we're among family aren't we here so we want to we well, want you know we want to hear the truth <laughs> i don't i don't think it the two can't they, they don't coexist yeah. for me and i think that you know for those from 2020 to 2021 and beyond <laughs> i was not sleeping and those experiences also didn't allow me to sleep. And I really even didn't realize it until after the Derek Chauvin trial was over. Um, how extremely chaotic that really was. And I think, uh, you know, mental health took a big hit. Sleep was non-existent. Yeah. You know, so self-care was not, was not there. You know, it was barely there. Um, so I don't know where that would exist within it. And I was reminded, actually, that's, that's a note I think I wrote down somewhere in these, all of these tabs here. <laughs> you know, there's a song. A lot of, a lot of the work, um, a lot of the titles are inspired by um, lyrics. Um, some of you may have seen them, some maybe not. Um, and there's one song, a protest song, and it says that we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. And that's a really, just a really tough song for me because it's like, wow, <laughs> rest can't exist for people who are fighting for freedom or what they feel freedom should be or know it should be. But I would argue that... Um, there are forms, from my experience of you, I think it's, I mean, it's, oh, it's always good to have someone else witness outside, yeah. just in terms of like the act of cooking, cooking meals, I mean, the act of cooking for family. Well, we talked about that yeah, the other day. Yeah, doing barbecue, barbecue or the Juneteenth, the Juneteenth that we did, or you and I were on the phone several times encouraging, you know, I, mean, I think it's the, the basic stuff in terms of like taking a bath. I mean, how one could witness someone else, this idea of it getting to a tub or eating or self-care. And um, what was fascinating for me, because I've been listening to the, um, the, the rest ministry, <laughs> I was telling uh, Professor Deb Willis that I put that on at night sometimes before I go to bed, but with the iPhone, but I put it on airplane mode, <laughs> you know, but, and sometimes I'm waking up at one o'clock in the morning and it's still playing. And they talk about even like our mothers and our grandmothers and great grandmothers that even, I mean, waking up and waking up and seeing my grandmother um, praying three hours in the morning. I mean, that was something. When we stayed over at my grandparents' house to go to church, we got up at 7 a.m. But my grandfather was up at 4 a.m. and he started prayers for the family on the West Coast and then went all the way over to the East Coast and or even coming back after Sunday school or coming back after school and seeing my grandmother in the kitchen and just seeing her there and there was almost like all the idea of cooking or making biscuits so I think in a way that um, we have found those pockets you know of rest or self-care clearly um, through through music, you know, through dance, you know, through the you know, through the black church, you know, I think clearly there has been those pockets, you know, um, of how one restores, you know, um, rest- restores ourselves, rest- restore ourselves, and or through music. I mean, the idea of the club, you know, and the fact that you know, listening to to jazz, you know, or you know, or, or I mean, all that, you know, has been without question, where would American culture be today without those, those vestiges of, let's say, how we have rested or have found w- other modalities, you know, think about where would American music be without that, for example. Um, so I think, or, or literature for that matter, you know, or, or poetry. So I think we have clearly, and I think without question, when I look at your work, and that's what I find most fascinating about this book, is that it conceptually narrates that, thank you. Does that say time is up? 
<laughs> it conceptually, now we're going to have a couple minutes for questions, I'm sure. It conceptually offers us as a viewer, and not only us, but for generations to come, that will document, because at one point, there may be some students in the classroom who might decide to have kids, who might have kids, et cetera, and they may ask about a Breonna Taylor or George Floyd, and the book will be able to offer evidence of the protest and someone was witnessing, not through CNN, you know, not through democracy now, but has put their own body in the site to actually offer um, a way of taking it in and preserving that history. So I think it's important to acknowledge that. Simultaneously, the your excavation of the relationship between black people, specifically black fathers in relation with, to, their, to their sons, through the, the act of writing. So it's, it, there's a tension between that, cultur that um, the part which is about healing, I mean, it's very beautiful, and at the same time to witness through the documentary impulse that aspect as well. So I think there's a tension for me and it's deeply rich. So. So I want to you know, commend you on that and for the extraordinary um, book um, that you have um, offered you. us. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. So do we um, have any questions? Of course, we have a legendary. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I don't need the mic. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> oh. It's, it's Tell us who you are. I am King Anthony Jones, and I'm definitely not legendary and at all. Legendary scholar. <laughs> Do you work with Josh? Yes, I work with McFadden on um, on the monograph with George Eastman. Um, I don't know if this is a question, but mostly um, maybe like an explication of a lot of things that you all unearth. So, and also a lot of things that me and Josh talk about with the conception of home. There's multiple conceptions of home and um, layers of home in McFadden's home. It's his family home in relationship to this kind of relationship to the ambivalence of home in the state of the country. But there was something that you, you all brought up that was really amazing that I've been actually um, dealing with or recently that came into my sight was about the thinking and being are inseparable because I heard it in a steward. Well, someone was... David Scott was talking about his relationship with Stuart Hall and how he was an intellectual and how his intellectual, how his biography informed his intellectual life and he could not make them inseparable. It's the same, in the same concept with the boys as well. Because the boys, you know, with black, um, dark, sorry, dark princess writes a novel because there's the only way he could conceive certain types of narrative is through fictional writing, which you go into the conversation about imagination. There was just several layers about the dog nation of the state on black people, but what flourishes underneath that is the love for justice, the love for equality, the love to fight still underneath that subordination. And I thought that was just a really um, there was just so much information that was brought out of the, the, the conversation between the two of you all. It was really amazing. I hope it was recorded because it would be really, oh good, we can use it for something else. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, that's interesting. Yeah, home. And when we, can, when we think about home, we should be thinking about rest, like a, a place to rest. But, it, you know, we do talk about home a lot and, you know, you know, um, African Americans actually like kind of being torn away from their true home, and we are kind of still trying to find what home actually means for us. Some people say home is where the heart is, and that can literally be anywhere. You know, it's and and do you rest when you truly find where that space is? You know, um, or are 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 people just looking forever? Well, that's the question. Well, the relationship which you're talk you speak of in some of your work is about, and I remember this, and went at a, and I think it was like the late seventies in Morrison's writing. She talks about multiple relationships of home, but at that oh, time, of home, Mo Tony writes about home consistently. But she, um, what becomes is what comes out in the New York Times article 
around the Song of Solomon is about she writes about wanderers who can't find it. One they wander they wander their way from home and can't find their way back to home. But in later novels, they do find their way home, or they never come. They never actually have a space of home in many definitions. And it's the same thing in your work. But what you're getting at the heart of is about self making. How do we understand ourselves as people? How do you, the constantly the humanity of black people that's always questioned so how do you consistently use your photographic work to always say we are people we are humans how when a state does not see us as such so those questions are always underlining the work and the where well, you know the the use of photography to make in frederick Douglass to always position himself as a person thus he puts himself into that view of the camera. And now we need Professor Lewis to step in. <laughs> um, thank you both for, I just, I have so many thoughts on this conversation. But one of the questions I wanted to ask Josh was, you know, I think we often think about, and we're, we're wrestling with this as a center. Um, I did a talk with Trisha Hersey at the um, Schomburg. That was the event that actually kicked off this series. And Trisha definitely looks at rest as a resistive act, an act of resistance, and something that you have to actively steal and claim. And I definitely embrace that and try to embody it, although it is very difficult. Very good. It is really difficult to do. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Um, but I also am interested in, in maybe those moments that are much smaller acts of resistance that we're not even aware of. And when I look at the images, um, I'm really struck by the use of quiet in your photos. And even the, the affective result for the audience is that looking at them or for the viewer or for those who are witnessing the witnesses <laughs> work, um, that there's, there are moments like this one that just go, you know, I think rest is also about the ability to breathe a little deeper than you might have, uh, you might have been able to breathe, even if that, that is not like a conscious act on your part. And art, particularly your work, um, is allowing us to do that. So I'm really interested in if you could talk to us a little bit about the use of quiet in your work. Oh, good question. Yeah, yeah. Um it is a big, it's a really big part of the work, even in, so, you know, these were made in a studio, you know, studio setting, and a lot of um, photographers, when they work in a studio, they'll play music, and so when we talk about quiet in the literal sense, I, I like the studio to be quiet so that the participants can think about things, and it sometimes gets, aw it gets awkward for them because they're expecting probably something else and not to, um, they're not expecting questions and questions that um, are not uh, um, disrespectful, but questions that are actually, you know, uh, caring. Um, a lot of the participants said, wow, nobody's ever asked me what I thought about being a black man in America. And that shocked me, right? And they were able to kind of write in that quiet moment. But also, you know, I think just my, I think my personality comes, comes through in the photographs. You know, I'm a quiet person. I like kind of somber, mellow photographs. You know, that just, it just happens, I think. Do, do you, what do you think? Um, yes, I mean, so you I mean, I have my loud moments. <laughs> I do ha I have those, but. We, we hung out at Carousel. Where were we on the. Uh, uh, oh, the, uh, oh, the ATVs. Carissa, <laughs> <laughs> did, um, did you have a question for us? Carissa oh, Lynn. Oh, he, he has a question there. Oh. Hey. about the, the sorry hi um congratulations hey. um i'm thinking about the process of grief right where we're now two and a half years into this pandemic into this iteration of uprising and you're you're engaging a lot with 
what it means to to hold momentums of of both life and and also grief and i think being someone who loves a lot of people who have have left and um has loved a lot of people who have survived the process of leaving how do you how do you contend with memory and image and how do you contend with with what happens when a person's image survives beyond them um, in some ways you're kind of tasked with holding someone in a moment but you're also tasked with these images become massive symbols and and what you're asking for in in this is is rest but there's always a, a tension there right because if people who are in constant processes of survival and hope are also asking for rest they're also being forced and foisted into positions where they're unwittingly becoming symbols of resistance or being disembodied from the lives that they live and so i guess how do you hold that tension how do you contend with that how do you contend with the history of their lives and the kind of future of the image um when the image itself can't really rest even if the person needs to oh good question yeah, the images never rest. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you said that because, you know, the, even just the, the method or the act of photographing captures that tension and it, it, and it's, it'd be there forever, you know? And that's the kind of stirred upness you feel when you're, you're looking into the, Im in the images. Um, you know, this moment, I mean, I, this is actually in Charleston. After the shooting happened at the church in Charleston. And that child was there, with, you know, standing outside the church, witnessing um, families crying, um, caution tape, people praying, singing. You, you see what I'm saying? And so that is captured in that photo, um, the quietness, but the portrait, what that um, little girl may have been feeling at the time. But then it also, if you look at the portraits where I'm asking people to write and tell us about their stories, um, they do the questionnaires before the portrait is made. And so, as I'm making the portrait, all of those things are on their mind. And so, there's always that back and forth, that tension, as you say, um, within the photo. And that is purposeful because I do want it to serve as evidence. That's why the project's called Evidence. <laughs> you know, so some people have the newspaper, I brought them for the students, and I named it Evidence because um, with the history of photography, um, you know, photos weren't always used to celebrate African Americans. Um, you know, they were used to dehumanize and to use as tools to prove um, that black people were not human. And, to, and were put in archives at universities <laughs> to further push that idea, right? And so we're still battling with that. Those photos still exist, just as these exist. So what, what do we do about that? Right, you have great artists like Carrie Mae Weems who take those artists and or take those photographs and start to reuse them remake or represent them but that intention from that photographer will always be there we're dealing with those energies all the time and we're, we're dealing that with those energies within these photographs um, and so it's very important for m my intentions to be set before I begin to work and I think that's probably what you were getting at as far as how do you prepare to go to photograph protests or whatever. Um, you know, it has to be a very clear intention um, beforehand. Yeah. We have another question back here and then we'll oh. go to a show of hands. Okay, he, he was waiting up here for a minute okay. too.
Thanks for this vital conversation. I really appreciate it. With video being so pervasive, uh, speak about how making pictures, making quiet uh, art images, how it can represent uh, the sovereignty of quiet. Uh, what can photos do uh, that videos cannot do? Oh, um, many things, you know? I think that um, with video or film, um, you almost, you have to see the entire thing to make a judgment on what it is. I think a photo, you know, a photo you're, you're left with to wrestle with, you know, one, one frame essentially. Um, and I think that that one frame, if it can leave an impact, um, you know, it's that, it's that much more powerful. Um, I'm not really a person that, you know, is down with video, down with cinema. I, I mean, I like it all. I mean, I have video pieces. You just didn't see them. <laughs> and I think they both serve their purpose. Um, and I wouldn't say that one is better than the other. Um, but I think they both um, have their benefits. We have time for about one more question. Yeah, okay. I think oh, there was one. Like who, who else had a question? Let, let's take these three questions. And then that's yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, 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 how about if one, two, three. Question, and then you guys answer in that way in case there's any overlap. So everyone should have a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, the question, I'll help. I'll help. Um, just bearing in mind, like, the idea of bearing witness. Hi, Professor McFadden. Um, and what it means to be present in those moments. How do you ensure that you're keeping yourself, like, within a barrier of protection? Because these are very intense moments that you are capturing and ensuring that there's a level of, like, normalcy within yourself once you're in the process of organization and just identifying what you like to put together. Hmm. You said, uh, how do I create a barrier of protection? For, let's hold say... On, hold on. Where oh. was the next question? Okay. Barrier of protection is one. <laughs> <laughs> my apologies for my voice, but um, um, when I just noticed as you were speaking, there's like just such a level of uh, softness and compassion, um, especially in regards to the portrait work. And um, I wanted to hear you talk about uh, the choice of language between saying making a portrait versus taking a portrait, and um, whether that's uh, sort of something that you fell into or something that was intentional. Oh, okay. Wait, yep. And then Layla. Thank you. Uh, my question, I was curious about your initial journey to Minneapolis and what, your, what you envisioned and what your intention might have been versus arriving there and then being on assignment for a publication and versus in, in thinking about what you documented and um, what you came away with and was that what you were envisioning? You know, so I'm, I guess my question is, your personal uh, kind of vision of witnessing and coupled, coupling that with being on assignment. Um, I do, I do. So barrier of, of protection, I was gonna ask for all of the projects or ju is it just the um, protest work? Interesting. Um, I think f f with, the, with the protest, there was no protection. I mean, you have these things that are, su you know, supposed to protect you, um, things that I didn't have. This is going to get into Layla's question a little bit. 
Um, you know, I was not initially on assignment when going to Minneapolis. I was just going because I felt I needed to go. And so, um, yeah, I didn't have, I didn't have a, what do you call those, the vest and all of that stuff. I just had my camera and one lens and, and my spirit. You had, you know, well, I come as well, how many? One thousand? How many? No, no, just in terms of like what is it? Like well, when you're in that, and it's question. Yes, yes. What do you become at a certain point mm -hmm. to somehow go? I mean, this is what I'm talk about to occupy that space. I think. Well, but, but wait, but wait. Yeah. I think that's a tough question for me because I didn't have that information. So that is not that is not the state I was in no, of course when I was right. going. The question is, yeah. To identify mm -hmm. that deep energy that courses through the body to mm -hmm. go and to witness and be present. Well, someone ha would have to tell me what it was. Well, Do you see what I'm saying? So I can't, right, so I don't. But you did hear it in the process, because that's what you said. You said you mm -hmm. meditated, mm -hmm. and then you were moved by an energy that you, you haven't even really articulated yet that you had to go. Right. And I think that that might be what we're referring to. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what well, that's what I mean. Really, if you if you think about it, yes. no, but seriously, I was leaving the barrier of, of protection. If you think about it, I was not. I was le I was going as the protesters were as journalists. They were leaving their homes, right, and leaving this idea of a barrier of protection. So, you know, whether or not I had a spiritual practice, et cetera, et cetera. The meditation led me to go, and that's all I did. And then, and that's it. So I, you know, and that's a lot. And that's that's what I did. And so, I, to be honest, that's just what I did. You know, I, I can't. You know, I'm, I can't really come up with a fuller answer than that. Well, I think it's a great answer. I think mm -hmm. it's also, but I think that's the act of becoming, and also still young in terms of we name that. Really, name it would mean to have to identify with fear. The fact that you were, you did witness, and I right. think getting back to the question in terms of taking versus making, making. Um, Deb Deb Willis taught me that. Um, in 2016, when she first saw Come to Selfhood, which is her favorite project, um, and I think I said, I took. A photo or something like that and she said no you made a photo and I said oh I did you know that's that's interesting and um, it goes way back it just goes back as I di you know dived uh, dove into um, um, Frederick Douglass and portraits the act of making portraits um, and the idea of what taking portraits actually means um, and people talking about um, how they, you know, to decolonize the camera, um, going back to the idea that people use the camera to from black people, to take their humanity away from them. And so to decolonize that, uh, the camera and the language, right, is to say, oh, I made this portrait of you, and there's a collaboration with making the portrait. Um, and so that comes with me trying to find the language for what I do. And so I guess my next step is to find it, find the, uh, a language for the barrier, the bar the barrier of protection. That's a good question. Thank you. Yes. Great. I want to just, can we just give a really serious round of applause Thank here for who were able to share tonight. And to our audience, like y'all were great, especially all the students, the students, and I don't know if he forced you to be here or what the situation was. I'm joking, but this was really great to have you here and to have your energy. Um, we're about to do a book signing in the.
back. So I'm going to turn you over to the wonderful people at our bookstore. And it, you know, if you want to purchase the book, this would be a great time, and you can have it signed in the back. Thank you again for coming. Thank you so much, Dr.